On page 14 in this edition that I have right here, Professor McGonagall talks about Harry and she says, and I quote, he'll be famous, a legend. I wouldn't be surprised if today was known as Harry Potter Day in future. There'll be books written about Harry. Every child in our world will know his name. And what can I say? She was absolutely right. Hey everybody, it's Eden. Welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I'm going to talk about the beloved Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. But this is not going to be a book review kind of video. I am going to assume that you read it and you're familiar with the text because I really want to look at it through a critical lens and examine the gender roles and power dynamics in this magical world. <laughs> I really want to see whether this book truly breaks away from the traditional gender stereotypes or if it maintains the status quo. The series popularity has attracted a lot of scholarly attention, lots of debates and analysis from various perspectives. But in today's video, I'm going to focus on one perspective and that is gender. Quick note, from this point on, unless stated otherwise, whenever I say the book or Harry Potter, I'm only referring to the first book of the series, and that is Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, or the Sorcerer's Stone, depending on where you're from. And quick note number two, I'm a huge fan of this series. It's actually the first book I read that made me fall in love with reading and with books in general. So no matter what I'm going to say in today's video and no matter all the criticism I read about the text in preparation for this video, nothing could ruin this book for me. So <laughs> if you are a big fan as well, just so you know that although some of the things might be a bit hard to digest, I'm right there with you in admiring this text. Okay, I think we're ready to start. So first off, I think it's important to mention that many critics argue that Harry Potter is not entirely original and that Rowling borrows heavily from pre-existing genres like the fairy tale and the school story genres. That these genres have certain features that often perpetuate traditional gender roles. So the question is, does Harry Potter break away from these conventions or does it reinforce them? Now, although the claims that Harry Potter follows the fairy tale genre are quite convincing, I think it's even more convincing to compare it to the school story genre. The school story genre has all the familiar elements of the British public school system. Now you're probably aware that British public schools are different than American public schools, but just in case you're not, the difference is that in the States, a public school is a school that is supported financially by the government and usually offers free education. Now in the UK, public schools are private, prestigious boarding schools that are open to the public, but you are required to pay tuition and normally a very high one, so only those who are privileged enough can attend these schools. Now with that said, think about Hogwarts. It has all the hallmarks of a traditional British public school. It has houses, a food hall, dorms, social hierarchies, a competitive spirit, and a strict system of rewards and punishments. Now these elements echo what is considered to be the origin of this school story genre, and that is Tom Brown's School Days by Thomas Hughes. Now this story celebrates the privileged white male hero who is naturally strong, brave, and masculine. And after a close reading, it seems like Harry Potter follows this traditional path quite closely. Now, some critics like David Stige, for example, argue that Harry Potter is actually quite radical with its treatment to social hierarchies and gender roles, but does it really challenge these conventions? Let's dig deeper. 
traditionally, British public schools were gender segregated and exclusively for boys. Now, in Harry Potter, Rowling changes that by presenting a co-educational system with both male and female students and faculty. So on the surface, it seems quite progressive, right? However, Hallman and Donaldson argue that one of the reasons the books are that successful is because they reproduce the familiar gender roles. So basically, including female characters alone is not enough to claim true gender equality. I really want to talk more about Hallman and Donaldson research because I find it super interesting. They point out that female characters throughout the series are still a minority. So for example, in the first four books, there are 29 named female characters versus 35 male characters. Across the entire series, there are 115 females to 201 males. Now these numbers suggest an imbalance. Even if we think about the faculty that has an equal number of male and female professors, we see that qualitative differences matter. Think about the four houses, for example. The most important ones were founded by male characters, and the main fight between good and evil is between these houses as well. And this perpetuates the traditional gender stereotypes. Now let's talk about Professor McGonagall. She is a fascinating character. On one hand, she is this strong, no-nonsense figure who's high up in the Hogwarts hierarchy. She's the head of Gryffindor, a transfiguration professor, and even the deputy headmistress. That's pretty powerful. But here's where it gets a bit tricky. Right from the beginning, her power seems limited compared to her male counterparts. Well, Harry immediately recognizes and respects McGonagall's authority, acknowledging that she was not someone to cross. Rowling still ensures that Harry and his friends have no problem lying to her, and she implies that they would probably wouldn't even dare to lie to Dumbledore because Harry thinks that Dumbledore knows pretty much everything. So what we learn here is a woman's authority can be subverted, whereas a man's authority must be obeyed. In the traditional patriarchal relationships of power in the traditional school story genre, male characters are depicted as more powerful and more fun than females. Now, this is crystal clear when you read the conversation between McGonagall and Dumbledore in the first chapter. On page 10, again in this edition that I have right here, Professor McGonagall is shocked when Dumbledore recognizes her disguise and she asks him, how did you know it was me? She asked. And he replies quite condescendingly, I must add, my dear professor, I've never seen a cat sit so stiffly. Now, I know this perhaps implicitly points out to her rigid personality, but it also contributes to the stereotype of the frigid woman who sacrificed her femininity in exchange for power. As if to prove him right, McGonagall refuses a sherbet lemon from Dumbledore because she didn't think this was the moment for sherbet lemons. She spent the whole day observing Private Drive because to her, defeating evil is no reason to lose our heads. She refers to Voldemort as you-know-who, showing that she's scared, and Dumbledore has to stop her in the middle of the sentence to comment on what he calls all this you-know-who nonsense. So he is the brave one and she is the scaredy cat. He is the fun, casual man that all the characters and readers as well are fonder of. And in Hogwarts, it's the same. She acts as the school marm who is there to punish Harry and his friends for breaking the rules, while Dumbledore encourages Harry by gifting him the cloak of invisibility. So throughout the book, McGonagall has both moments when she's a stereotypical female and moments when she's an example of a strong, independent woman. According to Eliza Dressing, she's 
a woman who's doing her best in a world run by men. And she says, she's head of the most prestigious house, Gryffindor, and she's party to all important decisions. The structure of authority, the patriarchal society, places some constraints on her, but she's an empowered female within this structure. Even with all this in mind, and with the great magical powers Rowling provides McGonagall, she's still unable to protect Hogwarts from invasion when Dumbledore is not around. So Rowling constructs a gendered magical world where Dumbledore is equal to the task of vanquishing evil. McGonagall is not. Now let's look at Hermione. At first, she seems like a super smart, strong character. She's always got her nose in a book. She knows her spells inside out. She wears her Hogwarts robes on before they even get to school. But her intelligence and bossiness make Harry and Ron think that she's a bit too much and exhausting. They don't want to be friends with her initially because they think she's too earnest and serious. As the story progresses, Hermione's character transforms, becoming more emotional and less logical and basically falling into the stereotypical female role who serves only as an accessory that helps the white male hero in his quest. For example, when she hears Ron calling her a nightmare, she hides in the bathroom and cries. A classic damsel in distress moment. When the troll shows up, instead of using her brains and magical powers, she needs Harry and Ron to come and save her. It seems that her weakness is Ron's strength because he somehow manages to knock down a troll with a spell that he had never been able to perform successfully before and a spell that Hermione had already mastered. So it seems like this dangerous situation brings out the best in Ron and Harry and the worst in Hermione. This moment marks a significant shift in Hermione's character because it is then when she lies to her professors for the first time and she takes the blame, which only emphasizes male heroism over female capabilities. Menor Smith interestingly points out that while Ron immediately becomes friends with Harry, Hermione has to prove her worthy of their relationship. We see that only after transforming into a more familiar stereotypical female role do Harry and Ron become compliant with the idea of her joining their pack. Even when Hermione shows her strengths like saving Harry during the Quidditch match or helping with the Devil's Snare, she often does so only after Harry or Ron commends her to. And the three are actually lucky that Harry doesn't lose his head in a crisis. That's what Ron says here. So basically, even with all her intelligence, she can't think for herself and she needs her male counterparts. And by the end of the book, Hermione is a shrew tamed. She more closely resembles a stereotypical female character than the strong, opinionated girl she originally was. Now, if you compare her behavior with the behavior of her male counterparts, Harry and Ron, you'll see that by the end, she shrieks, screams, and speaks nervously, reactions the boys do not have. By the end of the book, it seems as if Rowling wanted to ensure the supremacy of the white male doesn't go unnoticed, so she emphasizes Hermione's submissiveness to Harry and undermines her capabilities by showing her devalues herself. So on page 308 it says, Hermione's lip trembled and she suddenly dashed at Harry and threw her arms around him. Hermione, Harry, you're a great wizard, you know. I'm not as good as you, said Harry, very embarrassed as she let go of him. Me? 
said Hermione. Books and cleverness. There are more important things. Friendship and bravery. And oh, Harry, be careful. But this conversation also perpetuates the traditional school story genre by insisting that classes and grades and learning are not nearly as important as becoming a proper and ideal English gentleman. So what we see here again is that Rowling is keeping with the traditional structures of the school story genre and celebrates the white male hero who naturally possesses these desirable qualities. Let's not forget the portrayal of sports in the book. Quidditch is a big deal at Hogwarts, much like sports in traditional British public schools, and it gets a whole chapter. At first glance, it seems quite subversive. We have some successful female players on the team. We have Professor McGonagall, a woman who's passionate about the game and even gives Harry his first broomstick. And the fact that Quidditch requires the players to fly on broomsticks is in itself quite subversive because broomsticks are mostly associated with female witches. But if we look closer, we see that whenever female players uh, score, it's barely noticed. And even the male commentator, Jordan, speaks about how attractive Angelina the Chaser is in front of the entire school. And who are the stars of this game? You guessed it, the captain and the seeker, both male. And Harry, the chosen male hero, naturally excels and wins this game. And this reinforces this idea that men are naturally better. So on the surface, this book may appear to challenge the traditional gender roles because of its inclusion of strong female characters, but a closer reading suggests that it often reinforces the patriarchal structures of power and privilege. So while it offers a magical escape it still reflects a patriarchal reality where boys and men hold the ultimate power. Girls and women might master magic, but its power belongs first and foremost to boys and men. Thank you so much for joining me in this exploration of gender in Harry Potter. I really hope that it was interesting and that this kind of video has given you something to think about and encouraged you to look critically at even our most beloved stories. And with that, I'll let you go. Thank you so much again. Let me know what you think and I'll see you in my next video. Bye.